Hi, my name is Laura McDonald and I'm lucky enough to work here at the beautifully preserved Georgian Kitchens in Calendar House in Falkirk. At the time of the First World War, Calendar House was still a private family home and this beautiful room was the family's library. Nowadays, it holds the Falkirk Archive, a lovely collection of historical documents that helps us to tell our local story. 2014 marks the centenary of the start of the First World War and I'm personally fascinated by the local stories of food rationing and shortages. For example, here we have some documents from the archive of Denneborough Council. This is a fantastic notice explaining the reasons for rationing. Save the bread and the bread will save you. Four fifths of our wheat comes from overseas and German submarines seriously reduce the supplies. By taking two ounces or one thick slice of bread per day less than you used to take and avoiding waste, you will help to defeat the Germans on your honour. Another initiative from Denneborough Council was the war cookery demonstrations again taking place in the public hall in Denny. So they were taking through subjects such as uh, economical food substitutes and uh, economical cooking methods such as bottling fruit and find economical meat substitutes. The mind boggles. These notices are all really fascinating, but I'd love to get in touch with the real tastes of the food of the First World War. So while I haven't managed to find any recipes just here, I've got a fairly good idea about where I could find some. I'm having a look through the Falkirk Herald archives, which we hold here in Calendar House. So this was from 1918, and I think, I've just found a rather interesting looking recipe for gingerbread sponge. I think we should give that one a go. This is still a family home during the First World War, although this kitchen wasn't actually in use by that point. It had only just been decommissioned after the house had been wired for electricity and they decided that a newer kitchen at the other end of the house would have been much easier to wire for electricity rather than these old ironworks. While the open fire was used for spit roasting meat, the bulk of the cooking was actually done down here on the range. So that full length of the range down there was fired again by coal, three coal fires inside. In 1841, this extension up here was added and it was actually plumbed for gas. Calendar House was the first house in the area to get gas lighting and they actually gave the cook a gas range so that she could control the temperature that, that she was cooking on. Okay, so here's the recipe that I have printed out from the Falkirk Herald archives. Um, so for gingerbread sponge it says, take half a pound of golden syrup, two ounces of butter, one egg, half an ounce of ground ginger, ten ounces of flour, two ounces of sugar, about two tablespoonfuls of milk and half a teaspoonful of soda. Now, um, I'm all, uh, <laughs> I would normally be a stickler for following things to the letter, but self-raising flour is a lot easier for the modern baker because other things have changed in the ingredients rather than just the quality of the flour over the last hundred years. If you look at the quality of our milk, for example, now this recipe states that you have to dissolve the soda in a little milk before adding it to the recipe. The reason they did that is because the milk in those days wasn't uh, treated the way that ours is. It was a lot more acidic, a lot more bacteria in there to cause a chemical reaction that helps to raise the cake. Whereas our modern milk doesn't have that quality, so it's just easier and much more reliable to use self-raising flour in that context. Now, during the First World War, there were massive flour shortages, um, as well as sugar shortages. So, uh, treats like this would have been uh, fairly rare during the war. Rationing wasn't introduced until uh, later on in 1918, but um, the Germans were running hu uh, a very successful submarine fleet that were targeting the supply ships and about 60% of Britain's uh, food supplies at that time were actually coming from abroad. So it really did affect the quality of the food that was over here. 
the British flour that we could produce was getting bulked out with all sorts of other things like hay and wheat bran and it was getting much much heavier and much harder to work with and that, uh, it was flour that then produced a much more unpleasant result. Okie dokie, so that's just about there. Um, okay, so what's next? In a saucepan, stir the milk, butter and syrup until dissolved, then stir into the dry ingredients. Okay, um, oh, there it is. Right, there we are. Okie dokie, so that was milk, butter and syrup. So we'll just pop the butter in there. There we go. Most sugar products were quite hard to get hold of. Rationing was introduced later on in the war, around the beginning of 1918, and it was actually just to ensure supplies across the population rather than to limit consumption. So these things were available, they just weren't always, uh, it wasn't something that you could rely on. There we go, and just said about two tablespoonfuls of milk, so there we go. And then we just need to pop that back on the heat to warm through. So that's on its way. Next thing we need to do is just quickly beat an egg and that will all get added in together in a wee second. Because of these food shortages, there was a big problem with food hoarding. People that could afford to could go to the shops and buy absolutely everything out. There was a huge problem with this in Falkirk at that time, uh, where the local poor house was actually fined £20 by the Sheriff Court for hoarding £800 worth in weight of tea. Okay, so that looks pretty much done to me. There we go. <laughs> it's all come together and it's nice and smooth, so it'll be much easier to beat into the flour. There we go. Pour that in there. It's not a difficult recipe at all. As you can see, pretty much everything just goes into the one bowl and then you give it a wee stir around. You don't need any of the technical equipment. You just need to give it a wee second just to cool down. You don't want it too hot, otherwise you'll end up cooking the eggs rather than beating them together. So you can just test the temperature. If it's not coming through the side of the bowl, then it's not too hot. So just give that a wee stir just to get it going. Then we'll need to add in our eggs. Now, as I said, this is an easy recipe. All I now need to do is give it a very thorough stir, nice and gently, because you don't want to knock the air that you sifted into that flour. It smells absolutely delicious. That golden syrup in the ginger is really, really powerful. It's lovely. A nice golden cake batter. Soldiers really appreciated the food parcels that the local people from Falkirk were sending out to them. Particularly during the war years, treats like this would have been really quite rare. Um, I think the wealthier families, like the Forbes who lived here, it wouldn't have been so unusual, but for the normal people of Falkirk, who had to contend with uh, the massive queues and the food shortages, then it would have been very, very unusual. There you go. I reckon that's ready to go in the oven. The written archive gives a wonderfully intimate perspective on life during the war. Edinburgh City has letters from the Gregg family who had a son and daughter in France. They really appreciated their food parcels, even managed to post honey and cream. Hugh Gregg wrote home asking for extra strong mints. If you were well off, you could buy food parcels. House of Fraser's in Glasgow started off as army and navy stores. Their price list includes a parcel that features pâté de foie gras puree. For some, at least, being at war was no reason to go without life's little luxuries. 
Food parcels were popular for morale, particularly when frontline rations had a very mixed reputation. One of the British Army staples was McConaughey's world famous stew. It was canned in Fraserborough and had quite a reputation. Wouldn't it be great to tell that story and recreate McConaughey's in our own kitchens? As the years went on, there were food shortages at home. There was a row in Aberdeen Council over whether the legendary buttery should be classified as a roll. The bread order of 1917 controlled what went into rolls, but those crafty Aberdonians were passing butteries off as buns. So what's the story behind the government tinkering with the bread? You'll find these stories and more fascinating documents in the Edible Archive. Meanwhile, let's try our gingerbread loaf. Here we go. Now, the original recipe that we're working with doesn't say anything about how to finish the cakes, so you could just have them plain, like I've done with these little miniature versions, but for the one that I made earlier, I have just decided that to give it a little finish with a little bit of water icing and a little dusting of icing sugar, just to make it nice and pretty.